good morning and welcome to this session i am very happy to invite and welcome professor andrew ing as most of you know he has been associated with coursera prior to that he received his education in carnegie mellon mit and berkeley uh, he offered his first course in machine learning which was taken by more than 100000 people online he is actually a very strong ai researcher and his work in ai is trying to bring in to bear on education currently he is the vp and chief scientist of baidu but he has also set up deep learning to exploit the ai more meaningfully there is a lot to professor anju but i would like to conclude this introduction with a small anecdote which a past student of mine mohammad khadra jo mentioned when he was at berkeley he he says that we recall that andrew was a soft spoken person but extraordinarily brilliant and when they saw the terminator movie in which the skynet was introduced as a network which takes over the country at the world and so on they said they don't know whether that is feasible or not but if it was one man who could build it was andrew ing so andrew all yours were very excited thank you so much for accepting uh, please go ahead Right. Okay. Hi. Um. Thanks a lot, Deepak, uh, for allowing me to join you via video conference. Um. I actually stepped away from my role at Baidu uh, several months ago, and I think that um, uh, my work in AI as well as in education sort of complement each other. And since this is a primarily educational audience, what I thought I'd do is share with you um what I'm seeing in AI as well as how that might affect your jobs, uh, affect your work as educators. Um, I'm going to try to use slides, so let me try sharing the screen, and um, uh, we'll see if uh, hopefully this will work. So I've been saying that AI is the new electricity, and uh, what I hope to do in the next twenty minutes or so, with plenty of time for your questions at the end, is chat a bit about the trends I'm seeing coming down in AI. Um, I think as the uh, founding lead of the Google Brain team, as well as more recently leading the thousand-plus uh, person AI group at Baidu, I've been fortunate to build a lot of AI products, including some AI products that some of you might use every day. And I think these revolutions in AI will have um, implications on education, uh, and, and it's really that that I hope to share with you today. So, you know, AI is the new electricity. Um, by that I mean. About a hundred years ago, the rise of electrification, uh, starting in the United States and then going to other countries, it transformed every major industry. Everything ranging from transportation to manufacturing to agriculture to healthcare and more. It's hard to imagine how you would run healthcare today. How do you even run a hospital without electricity? How do you run a manufacturing industry without electricity? And I think that AI technology has now reached the point where. We see a surprisingly clear path for AI to also transform every major industry, um, and so, you know many of you will have read about AI milestones in the news. Uh, everything ranging from the you know Google Cat. This is back in two thousand eleven, where uh, AI. This is my old team watching videos, learn to find cats in YouTube videos. To IBM Jeopardy. To the recent spectacular AlphaGo results, and I think AI technology is certainly. Doing amazing things that you know were barely imaginable just a few years ago. Um, more and more people around the world are also learning uh, AI technology. I guess Coursera has started with my machine learning course, and uh, recently uh, Jeff at Coursera and I and others have been you know uh, working on the new deep learning specialization. And so, thanks to tools like Coursera uh, and edX and and others. Um, there are now great tools for people all around the world to learn AI, and uh, for India specifically, um, we're seeing huge numbers of learners adopt AI, and I think this offers India a very interesting opportunity to leapfrog 
right? I, I think that India's uh, IT community is not as sophisticated as the US one in terms of developing software products. But the rise of AI technology, I think, gives the India tech ecosystem, the India tech community, a very interesting opportunity to leapfrog onto the next wave rather than competing on the previous wave. Now, AI will create tremendous value. This is why I've been excited to keep teaching for Coursera. Uh, to help more people learn these AI tools so that you and your students can gain the skills they need to invent all sorts of amazing things with AI. One of the challenges that AI will bring though is the implication on jobs. Um, so here's a picture of a call center. I, I think this might have been a, a, a call center in, uh, I think, Latin America, I'm not sure. But um, when uh, I have led teams that have gone into call centers, and this has happened so many times in my life now, where I'm sitting a couple of feet away from someone and I would spend um, half an hour interviewing them, say interview a call center operator to understand their jobs and uh, understand what they do. And then I would go home after that half hour interview, knowing that my AI teams had the capability or had the know-how to write software that will automate part of these individuals' jobs, right? And I've, I've, I've had this experience many times. It's a very strange experience, sitting two or three feet away from someone, um, knowing that their job can be automated by AI teams that, that, um, that I know equally well. Um, I think the displacement of work, the transformation of work is a global phenomenon. Uh, today, there are large call centers in the Philippines, the large call centers in Mexico, the large call centers in India, the large call centers in the United States. And this is just one of many categories of jobs that will be um, transformed by, by, by AI. Um, and by this, I don't mean just teams that I'm affiliated with, but teams that many AI teams, uh, jobs that many AI teams are, are uh, working on, I guess. Um, other examples. You know, uh, and, and this is really even just drawing on projects that I'm personally were affiliated with. Uh, companies like Drive.ai, autonomous driving company, uh, and many others will bring self-driving cars to become a reality. Um, in the United States, there are about 3.5 million truck drivers whose jobs over the next decade or two, I think will be significantly affected by the rise of autonomous vehicles. Um, and so when these 3.5 million truck drivers jobs start to go away or maybe go away entirely at some point, um, what will we have them do? And radiologists, uh, you know, I still have a group of PhD students at Stanford and we find over and over that we're able to build AI software that leads um, radiology images, uh, sometimes at a level of accuracy comparable to a human to a board certified radiologist, and sometimes at a level that's superior to, to a, you know, a, a board certified radiologist practicing here in the United States. And so this is affecting, um, and while as an AI technologist, I feel like that while some of these technologies are not yet here, um, the roadmap to developing these technologies further and placing them in the hands of users to help patients or to help people that need transportation, there is an increasingly clear roadmap. And these changes won't be overnight. Uh, some of these changes will take several years to come to fruition. Some of these changes may take even small numbers of decades, but the technology is there. And I think it is only a matter of time before these jobs are dramatically um, affected. So by the way, if any of you, you know, have, a, have a relative thinking of going into radiology, of going, you know, spending years of their lives learning to read radiology images, and they're wondering, is this really a good career path? I, I would say to, to, to your relatives, um, today, if you graduate with a degree reading radiology images, if you're planning for a you know, five-year career in radiology, then you're perfectly fine. But today, I just would not plan for a 40-year career uh, sitting in a, in a room reading radiology images. Now, um, uh, so there is a lot of um, mystique about uh, uh, AI. And, and just now, uh, Deepak uh, mentioned the Skynet. And by the way, for, uh, just, just for the record, I've been a fan of Deepak's work for many, many years. I think uh, 
was it in the first or second year of Coursera's lifetime, I had the good fortune to meet the park and learn about some of the really innovative educational experiments he's been running in India, and it was just a constant source of inspiration. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, what can AI really do, I think there's so much mystique about AI. I wanted to take a couple minutes to maybe get even more technical to tell you what AI can and cannot do. Um, it turns out that maybe 99% of the economic value of AI today is through just one type of AI called supervised learning. And that means learning input to output mapping. Um, so for example, uh, we've had this for a long time. Uh, input an email, tell me if you're spam or not. Um, uh, and recent, and the most lucrative example of this might be online advertising. So the large online website, your know, advertising companies all have AI of a form that input an online ad, uh, input, input some information about an ad and some information about you, and tries to predict or tries to figure out if you will click on an ad. Because with the large online ad companies, every click is money. And so there's a very strong financial incentive to build AI that um, you are just slightly more likely to click on. Maybe not the most inspirational example, but, but, but certainly uh, very profitable. Self-driving cars. One of the key components of self-driving cars at companies like Drive.ai uh, is a piece of AI software that inputs a picture of what's in front of your car and what the radar is telling you and tries to output the position of other cars. Um, and then more recent examples, you know, speech recognition is um, AI that inputs an audio clip and outputs a text transcript. Um, uh, we now have AI that can input a picture and output an image caption. At uh, landing.ai, where I'm founder and CEO, we can input a picture of something that a factory is making and try to tell you there's a defect in this part. Um, or I guess machine translation, input one sentence, output another sentence, um, and so on. And in the right context, all of these can be extremely valuable. Um, well, input a, one of my PhD students at Stanford is working on inputting ungrammatical text and then correcting the grammar. And the Achilles heel of AI today is that it needs a large amount of data of both the input and the output. But it turns out that when you um, take these input to output mappings, the technical term is supervised learning, when you put it in the right business context, like some of these examples here, it turns out to be incredibly lucrative. And also, um, this is sufficient to affect a lot of people's jobs. You know, when I've, when I've been leading um, large AI teams, what, a question that a lot of people asked me was, uh, what can AI really do, right? And one rule of thumb I've given is uh, anything that a typical person can do with less than a second of mental thought, we can probably either now or soon automate using AI. And it turns out that um, there are a lot of things people do with less than a second of thought that are very, um, uh, very uh, uh, important uh, and very lucrative. Um, and there are also a lot of people's jobs, who, who, whose jobs it is, is taking a lot of one second toss and string them together. And this pu puts their jobs at significant risk of disruption by automation. And so um, what, sh what, what are the implications <coughs> for education? Um, well, this is data from the United States. But if you look back about 50 years or so, this data I got from uh, Andrew McAfee. If you look at um, economic trends like labor productivity, private employment, household income, GDP, and so on, up until maybe about 15 years ago, all the curves went up and to the right. So, you know, the United States just got better and wealthier and companies did better and individuals did better and families did better. But what happened starting maybe about 15 years ago uh, um, was this great um, decoupling in which um, productivity went up, uh, real GDP went up, but individual median household income did not keep on climbing. Now, we are also seeing these um, slightly scary reports, right? So last year, PwC, uh, wrote this slightly scary sounding report that maybe 38% of jobs in the US are at high risk of automation. Um, the, and with, with varying numbers in, in different uh, categories. But to me, the, this is the scary message. You know, maybe 38% of jobs are at risk of displacement. Um, but the more positive aspect of this is that if 38% of jobs are at high risk of automation, maybe 62% of jobs 
are not at significant risk of automation. And in fact, the authors of this report pointed out that creative and critical thinking will still be highly valued. And in fact, the problem that we see worldwide is not that humans are running out of jobs. So supervised learning, input-output mapping, these A to B mappings, is not going to take over all of human work anytime soon. Um, in fact, we have all of these professions that we just can't seem to find enough people to work on. Uh, you know, as well as anyone, we just can't seem to find enough, um, can't seem to find enough teachers. Uh, we also can't seem to find enough healthcare workers. Uh, I think the World Health Organization is projecting a shortage of over 10 million healthcare workers worldwide. Um, and in the United States, we can't seem to find enough wind turbine technicians, right? And we certainly can't find enough software engineers. So there are many categories of jobs where we just can't find enough people. And so I think the challenge ahead is really one of education where there are so many jobs that we can't find enough people to work on, uh, very high value, well-paying jobs. Um, while at the same time, there are many categories of jobs that are going away quite rapidly, uh, going rapidly faster than previous, than, than these disruptions have happened in previous cycles. Um, uh, and I think that um, I, I honestly don't know any answer to this other than education. So, um, you know, when, when, when uh, we started Coursera, we used to say, we were saying this for many years, that the old model of education, where you go to college for four years and coast for the next 40, that makes no sense in today's rapidly changing world. And everyone needs to keep learning your whole life. And so, uh, because Jeff will speak more for Coursera, I won't talk as much about what Coursera is up to, but I think that Coursera, both through educating people directly through MOOCs, as well as through the rapid rise of the online master's degree programs, as well as all the companies and governments that are now working with Coursera uh, to level up their workforces, the employees and country citizens, I think all of those are great trends to help global workforce development. You know, I just want to close with a with a maybe a little bit of a personal note about about the challenge ahead, and I want to um, describe the challenge ahead with almost a look back on on one lesson I learned at the start of Coursera, right? But um, you know, one 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 lesson that is sometimes told for the rise of uh, Coursera was that in two thousand eleven, MOOCs quote suddenly went viral. Right. So my team launched two courses, the Sebastian team, students team launched one course, and then a few months later, uh, Anand Agarwal, edX joined, joined in the fray, and, and then MOOC suddenly went viral. Um, as a MOOC insider, I can tell you that nothing suddenly went viral. Um, and, and as an example, uh, and, and really, you know, my own story uh, was uh, many, many iterations that you probably never heard about. So 2007, started putting video lectures online. 2008, started putting short video quizzes online. Uh, 2009, built a rudimentary platform. 2010, you know, experiment with UGC. 2011, more circuit programming exercises. And then after trying all of these things for so many years, they suddenly went viral. And uh, maybe I'll skip this. This is one of the things that we tried that really didn't work. Um, I'll skip this in just a time. But one of the lessons I learned was that um, it took us many iterations, including many bad ideas that you know you will never have heard of, um, before we put together a formula for MOOCs that um, uh, we, before we put together enough of the ideas to allow MOOCs to suddenly go 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 viral when several of us, uh, really Sebastian Thun and me, and then later Daphne Carly joining us, um, to to finally have it work well enough. Um, to, to, to attract a large audience. And when I look at the challenge ahead, I feel like that um, it still feels like day one. When I look at the way we teach today, uh, the, the, I'm still an active uh, participant in Coursera, but uh, I'm also spending a lot of time with AI for manufacturing and trying to figure out how to educate some of the people who work in manufacturing, whose jobs will be displaced. But my own state of knowledge about education feels only slightly further along than you know, when it was 2007. And, and just today, my team and I were having a lively debate about whether we should be running one month training programs or six month training programs. And we just didn't know the answer. Um, but I think that the spirit of experimentation, and this is why I, I really enjoy talking about Deepak. I feel like I learned so much uh, every time I spend an hour with, with Deepak is, um, 
uh, maybe to quote Jeff Bezos, today still feels like day one, and it feels like there is more we don't know than that we do know. Um, and but but if maybe just just to close off with, with one last thought, the IT world, AI technology is so good at creating such valuable products. And if if I want to be brutally honest, here in the United States, it's created a lot of wealth. Uh, um, especially for the East and West Coast, right, for, of, of the United States. But um, if we want to create not just a wealthier society, but also a fairer one, uh, one where every person has a good chance at meaningful work and a meaningful um, education and the opportunity to learn a earn a great living for themselves and their families. Uh, but if we want to create not just a wealthier society, but a fairer one, then all of us that work in education still have important work ahead of us. Um, and, and every time I uh, work on these projects, I picture some of the people working in call centers or the drivers or the radiologists or the manufacturing people. And I think it's important for us to um, make sure that all of us them, have, a, have an opportunity to get the education they need to have a, have a great livelihood. Um, so with that, let me uh, thank you all very much. And, 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 uh, and um, last comment, I, I, I hope to, over the next few uh, months, engage much more with India. So I'm looking forward to visiting India uh, next month. I was speaking at NASCOM, but I hope to have many more options to engage with all of you in the future as well. But let me just uh, say thank you very much and be happy to take questions. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Uh, I would just like to remind people of something which is sort of a byproduct of his presentation. But everybody quickly learned that long videos don't make sense to people. Short videos with reflection point is absolutely a must in any kind of engagement that you want to do. Let me get back to the main topic and invite questions from the floor. Uh, the mics are here. Uh, please uh, introduce yourself and ask the question. I'm Dr. Nandish, professor from Indus Business Academy. I have done three courses from Coursera. And in fact, after I did the second course, I got the offer as moderator of the content. Oh. Does your AI work on the background to identify the active learners? Because in one course, I got 92%, another 96 I was a very active learner, I can say. And maybe that is why uh, your AI engine picked me up as a moderator. Just curious to know. Yeah, I actually, I, I don't know if Jeff wants to jump. Jeff, Jeff is also online, you jump in. Our, our analytics team has been looking at analytics of learners to understand uh, who answers questions and who's highly engaged. And uh, if I remember, this is this helps us identify who we should invite to be moderators. I'm not up to date on the details of how that's done today, but I don't know if Jeff wants to jump in, feel free to. But uh, uh, Coursera has a lot of data and has a very sophisticated analytics team that is constantly trying to use the data to understand how to serve learners better. I would like yeah, to add that for such decisions, you don't require AI. For example, when we ran a faculty development program out of 4,000 qualified teachers, we simply picked up 200 top performers and made them as associate faculty subsequently. The AI is now required to figure out how effective those were in their interaction with the other faculty members who are being trained by capturing the interaction and then analyzing it. That's the harder problem. Next, please. Hi, Andrew Ram from Infosys. I completed your uh, machine learning course on Coursera last year. My question was on uh, what is your perspective on ethics in AI? Because the training data seems to pick up a lot of bias from what is already embedded, inherent in it. So how do you, what is your perspective on avoiding uh, bias and uh, you know, making sure AI is ethical? Yeah, so I think uh, it's a great question. So, uh, you know, right, so, so to, just to elaborate, right, one of the most uh, horrifying results uh, in AI was when a team at Microsoft showed that some AI learns this horribly and totally inappropriate analogy that man is the woman as a computer programmer is the homemaker, right? Just reinforcing the totally horrible stereotype that we would not like AI to have. Um, uh, so I think that uh, fortunately, um, today there are AI researchers working to remove these sorts of gender and ethnicity and 
uh, so on biases and AI algorithms. And while there's work to be done, we are making progress. Um, I'm just finishing up the fifth course for the deep learning specialization on Coursera. And we actually talk about this. We talk about one algorithm that we're using to set a bias. Um, while there's work to be done, one thing that makes me um, uh, optimistic about this field is that, frankly, today, we have much better ideas for removing bias and for reducing bias in AI algorithms than we have ideas for reducing bias in human beings. And in fact, uh, while there, I, I feel like we could reduce racism in AI much faster than we could reduce racism in the human race. Uh, but, but this is not to understate the importance and the amount of work we have to do still in both AI and maybe for the human race. Great answer. Thank you. We have time for just one more question. Yeah, here. Behind you. Good morning, Andrew. I'm Dinesh Kumar, part of IMBX team organizing this conference. Um, in your opinion, do you think the current Turing architecture and uh, Shannon's information theory is a limitation to improvement of AI? Yeah, um, boy, I wasn't expecting so many AI questions. I thought this is an educational audience. These are great questions. <laughs> um, you know, I think that uh, 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 the work on quantum computing, I think is great basic research, but I think it's still further off. Um, I'm not aware of any evidence that uh, the human brain um, needs principles fundamentally different. I mean, at the very lowest chemical interactions, all chemistry is quantum, but I'm not aware of any computational principle that the human brain really implements that you cannot implement with a, with a Turing-like architecture. So uh, I would be quite surprised, you know, the path from today to artificial general intelligence is so far, right? Who knows how many decades that will take, but I'm not aware of any reason that the uh, standard computers using a Turing-like architecture would not be able to get there. Uh, I think quantum computing could be great for other things, especially in crypto, but I think that uh, uh, it's quite possible that, I don't know when we get to AGI, artificial intelligence, maybe 500 years from now, but I would not be surprised if, say, 500 years from now, we finally figure out how to do that, that is still uh, based on a, a primarily you know, Turing like architecture of the form we have today. The future is the future. Some of this is uncertain, but I don't know of limitations of the Turing architecture that um, that, um, that, that, that feels very limiting right now. But that might change as we learn more. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrew. Just to conclude, I'll ask you one last question myself. You have portrayed a rather horrifying image of how jobs are going to be lost because of the AI. And uh, I appreciate that. But in the process, and this will take maybe 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, but in the process, we need to A, reskill all existing job holders in doing not the entire job that they were doing, but at least part of the job where human intervention is still required. And B, we need to create new job opportunities for activities which hopefully the machines cannot handle for quite some time. Towards this end, would AI be useful for A, predicting what kind of new job skills would be required, and B, helping us to train people to acquire those? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, yes to both. So uh, I've been very inspired by the work of um, Eric Brynolfsson and Andrew McAfee over at MIT on uh, understanding the labor market and what jobs we disrupted faster and what jobs may be being created. Uh, and, and there are a few groups around the world working on this problem. But well, maybe they're using less AI than statistics and analytics, but I found these studies very insightful. One, one thing that they know, but that one, one of the secrets that, that uh, maybe is not widely known is every time these economists publish a report saying these are the jobs that will be you know, displaced fastest, that's basically a playbook for AI research as well to try to figure out what jobs they should pay attention to these displays. But a lot of new jobs are also being created. Uh, and some of these analyses are, are using AI analytics. Um, in terms of AI for education, I, I, I think uh, uh, Jeff, in his presentation, he, he's actually, uh, Jeff, Jeff's a fantastic CEO, he's so lucky, Coursera's under his leadership. But I think under Jeff's leadership, Coursera has been uh, pursuing many ways to use AI to help education. So I think Coursera has been using AI to try to automatically understand if a quiz question has a bug in it, um, uh, 
are. Uh, or, and I think teams are using analytics to try to develop more sophisticated auto grading uh, to give learners richer feedback. Um, Coursera is so much content, right? Over 2,000 courses that is actually difficult for learners to figure out uh, what is the most relevant course for your career. So I think Coursera's AI team has done a great job understanding individuals' career goals to try to recommend to you the courses most relevant to you. I think that um, companies like Coursera have grown to such scale, there's so much stuff that uh, AI is playing an increasing, um, increasingly important role. But, but again, I feel like it, it's still early and, and that there's still a lot of work to, to, to do still to let AI play an even bigger role in education. Thank you very much. I'll only add a comment that only if Coursera and edX could think of reducing their charges from 50 or $100 to 10 or $15, which will be more affordable because we poor mortals in this part of the world earn in rupees and not in dollars. But that's about it. Can I, can I say something? Financial aid. One of the things I'm very proud of for Coursera is since day one, we've had financial aid. So if the fees, Coursera needs to break even at some point. Oh, no, no, don't take me seriously. I was just pulling your leg. Thank you. No, yeah. but seriously, tell the people to apply for financial aid and get it for free. I'm, I I'm understand. Very, yeah. Thank you so much, Andrew, for this wonderful talk and interaction. Let us give him a big hand. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Thank you very much, Professor Patrick. Thank you very much, Andrew, for this session. We're going to have a short commercial break of just about a minute while we play your video and then we switch over to the next session.